Hey everyone, it's another good day of recovery. Um, we're talking about family systems today. Um, I think it's really important to be able to understand this concept. Um, and it still grows on in my mind and heart to think systemically because it doesn't come naturally. Um, I, I learned from a person I trust recently that we're really have an overdeveloped left brain, <laughs> left brain over here, that I need to maybe look at this book he suggested, but we have really gone into more and more and more and more information and data and computerization. And we then tend to see the parts, but not how all the parts work together. We see a lot of trees, but not really the forest. Okay. So it's important to, to look at all this. Um, a crash course in family systems um, began in the 50s. Prior to um, this, you know, you had psychoanalysis, you had individual therapy. You really didn't, people didn't, I don't think they had marital systems. It was very individualized. You went in with your prom, you were seen as an individual, a person, and all that was great. But in the 50s, there were about five different types of therapists that all kind of discovered some similar um, dynamics. Um, and some of it occurred in like psychiatric wards when um, people with psychosis would be suffering, they would find themselves um, getting worse when family members came to visit. And probably that wasn't too novel, but they, um, started to ask the question, maybe the dynamic of mom, dad, and son had an effect on each other. And that maybe the system is stronger than the people in the system. That you have a mom and a dad and a son, and maybe another son, and put them together and something else happens. Um, maybe something spiritually happens, something um, pretty powerful happens, um, but it begins to take you for a ride. And so then they started to suggest maybe that the, the, the son is carrying the symptom for the whole family. Maybe he's carrying the shame for the whole family. Maybe he's the angry one for the family where mom and dad, keeping everything nice and calm and cool, repress everything. And then the son feels the anger and the energy. Or maybe there's conflicting messages that um, it's called a double bind where you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And the two conflicting messages then create tension within the person that they're not able to process. And so that then they kind of go out into psychosis as a coping mechanism. It's a very interesting thought. It's really not blaming parents. It could look like you're blaming parents, but what it's doing is it's seeing that the system is the cause of that. So that's where you might have heard the term boundaries and all that. And people say boundaries and they really are describing limits. But really boundaries have to do with the space around me that helps me know I'm Eric and that someone else is someone else. But if in my family system, I felt responsible for other siblings or mom and dad's issues, then um, I might have poor boundaries. And it's natural for children to lack boundaries there. I remember um, working with someone where there was psychosis involved. 
This is many years ago. And the family members would call up saying these words like, my mother gets angina, I mean, I get angina when so-and-so doesn't take their medication. So first of all, the medication didn't have to do with heart issues, but family members were feeling pain and suffering even the person who was feeling it wasn't doing the calling. It was the daughter of the person calling. So there's this like family confusion. Fancy words are like undifferentiated ego mass. Yeah, there's a mouthful. But undifferentiation has to do with this idea of not feeling like your real self, that you're not able to be yourself. Because when you're in the family system, you feel like you've become whatever they want you to be. And oftentimes then we so-called rebel to try to get a sense of self. For instance, this is a common one, say like a person's coming in and the family's quite worried, they're a college student, and the college student isn't doing too well just not studying and they were brilliant. They were working hard in high school. What happened? Uh, well, I explained the dynamics of how do you know you're going to college for why you want to go to college and not because your parents want you to go. So you almost have to consciously or unconsciously unchoose that to be able to know whether you're choosing something. So the, this unconscious drive to not do well. So with a little bit of separation, um, the person's able to sort out whether they really want to go to college or not. A lot of bowel issues or anxiety, um, eating disorders can be from a family system point of view. So I work with parents who actually this wouldn't identify anybody, but because it's many years ago, but we're talking about their issues, um, addiction issues, but they brought up how their son had bowel issues, hadn't had like a bowel movement in 21 days and explained that they'd have to go to the hospital and all these dynamics. And um, I said, well, and they would hold their stomach kind of while talking about it. It's like, it, and he was like about eight, I think seven or eight years old. And I said, just let it go. Just have to let go of those dynamics. Um, it's the only way to be free. And they, I, they had laxatives, all this stuff. And I said, no, just totally let it go. And they said, well, that's what everybody else said. It's like, yeah, if you disengage, he might then start to feel his own stomach and Next week they go, he went the next day. They said it was like miracle. Well, it's not miracle. It's, I mean, it, it is nice to see that happen. But the thing is, it shows you how powerful families are. There's certain symptoms that run in family. There's families that cope by somaticization where they really get sick more. They don't know how to really feel feelings. So what happens is they channel the energy into body complaints that in that family system it's much more acceptable to be sick and you get comfort and love um, you can't say i really am sad or i'm really angry with you again for some that would feel like mr rogers talk to be and i think mr rogers talk is the way to go but it feels so weird talking like that if the family's language isn't that. Um, you have family systems where there's high pressure to perform. They're just into performing, doing well, excelling. They're just not used to doing average work, whether it's be sports, whether it's academics or, or work. Like, it's the template is already set up, do your best. Like, what would it be like to not have that there? <laughs> just take that away, see what kids do, see if they want to do well, just to do well. That would be interesting. 
there are family systems where having fun is key. They just want to have fun. Um, they, um, they may work hard. Let's say that they, they work hard, but they also play well. And um, they have a lot of fun. There's a lot of laughing. Um, people can laugh at their own mistakes. Um, there's a deep acceptance for their humanity. Um, you know, acceptance is probably the opposite of shame. Shame-based families where we're not good enough, we feel worse than other people, we feel like we need to hide things, we might have addictions, we might um, feel like we're only okay if, you know, instead of I am okay. So then love becomes kind of unconditional and we don't even know it. Um, we may get more um, warm, fuzzy emotion by performing and we don't really just get it because of who we are. Being a new grandfather and having a baby and I'm just reminded that when a person is being born, we so value and cherish them and they haven't done anything except be born. They're cute, They're, we love them, we value them. What is that? Um, especially family members, we just, people are so excited. My friends are so excited with me. There's something really endearing about that. Um, and when people are older, um, when they're sick, frail, maybe being taken care of, they're not really earning anything or sharing their achievements or talents or even hobbies or anything. They're just there. There seems to be some truth about just accepting people as people and loving them because they are valuing them as they are rather than what they can produce or give us. Yeah, there's something powerful about that. So so I, I would like that as a family system. But, so let's talk about the dynamics of family system. So it's this mobile, you know, where things go in all these different directions. And if you move this part of the mobile, then this all affects. If I had a real mobile, you could see it. Um, the thing about family systems is they don't want to really change much. There's a fancy word, homeostasis. Okay. Um, homeostasis means uh, we don't want things to change. So we, um, it, it becomes rigid. Now, the more rigid a family is, the worse the dysfunction usually is, the more flexible it is, um, healthier. If things move a different dynamic to where um, it's chaotic, where there's no predictability. Um, let's spell it correctly here. Chaotic. Um, it's, it, there are chaotic family systems where there's no real stability, lots of drama, it's almost as if the family's addicted to drama. They get motivated by drama. Uh, so And so then when we grow up, are we going to be attracted to someone who is stable? We might, <clears throat> but we might be addicted to the drama. We might be picking other um, dramatic um, players in this. I better get some water here.
So the good news and the bad news with um, family systems is that they tend to want not to change. They like to stay kind of stuck. Now that's the good news. Once you get the family um, in a healthier place, it tends to want to stay there too. So that that's a plus. Um, it is like moving a cruise ship when you do family work. When people come and they sit in all the chairs, um, we notice where do they sit? Who sits where? Who sits with who? Um, do they all sit practically on each other's lap? Or do they um, give each other space? Who's the quiet one? Who's the one not talking? Often they have a lot to say. Who tends to want to take charge and be what we call the switchboard operator, the person who's going to talk for others, to manage others? Okay. Do the kids all sit together and the parents sit together? Or are the kids sitting, you know, with mom and dad's over sitting on the other side? And I don't make any hard predictions or judgments on this, but it is noted, it is interesting to see. And there's types of family therapy where the therapist will just, after a few sessions, say, hey, let's have Tommy sit over here just to, to move the dynamics. And by moving them physically, it actually changes them internally. Giving them tasks um, to do. Like if daughter and father are distant, um, you see this a lot when the daughter turns 15, the daughter's becoming more of an independent girl growing up. The dad doesn't know how to deal with her budding sexuality and kind of distances himself, which feels like rejection to her. And it's just the same dynamic. In fact, therapy school said you may see more adolescent girls than a lot of people. And it's somewhat true. And it's a simple fix. Um, in fact, the girl could have shoplift or start smoking or vaping or all these dynamics. Yep, it's as simple as help get dad involved. I gently, not quickly, but I tend to work quicker. Say, hey, where's dad in your life? Or where's dad? And enrolling the family to the idea that it's not just drop your teenager off and we fix that, <laughs> like dropping someone off for an oil change. Yeah, no, you need to stay in the car and be with the car and um, change yourself. But um, often when dad comes in, um, just a little bit of one-on-one -on -one interaction, it changes the dynamics up. Yeah, she gets be along better with her father because um, they're now just talking more. She gets along better with mother because it was like too much mother and not enough father. That's a dynamic we see a lot. Too much mother, um, not enough father. So you have, you know, mother and kids over here and dad over here. So you want to bring it to where mom and dad are here and the kids are down here systemically. We write it all on a whiteboard. Sometimes we just show them the dynamics and they're just like, that's us. And then we just openly ask them, how do you want to get closer? Where do you want this to move? Um, now, sometimes it actually, that's called direct, but if you can't really go direct because you just sense that they'd be better off, let's do things indirect. Then you just work with them to help move the dynamics. You get mom and dad getting a better relationship. Back in those 1950s when, um, they had people suffering from schizophrenia. This is what they would claim, and I believe it somewhat, is that when mom and dad would start to work out their difficulties, 30-year-old um, Tommy who had psychosis, his symptoms would start to get better, like, like magic. Like uh, We tend to overuse drugs and all this, and the psychiatric community would probably be really up in arms, like, how can you say that it's not? well? I think there's a system going on there, too, that um, doctors work in tandem with psychiatrists and people have bought into the idea that we're really just a bag of chemicals, really. 
sounds horrible, but everything's chemical. Well, let's go down this path. If I get really, really jealous, really, really jealous, I'm going to have physiological hormones run in that. A drug solution would say, okay, let's measure Eric's hormones there and come up with Jalexa that helps me deal with feelings of je jealousy. Or if I get really, really, really angry, well, there's hormones going on there. There's dynamics there. So there's always physiological dynamics. So let's not confuse um, cause correlation with causation. Sure, there's lots of chemicals correlated with things, but it may not be the cause. And I find that uh, people's problems aren't the lack of Zoloft, or they have a deficiency of Wellbutrin, or they have um, too little clonazepam in their life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that's what you're in essence saying, that that's how we're going to fix something is with the medication. Uh, maybe that person who's going through a nervous breakdown lost their job and two parents have died. That's probably an event. It may not even be the cause. The cause may be this poor soul doesn't have enough resources to deal with that hardship. And I'm not really against medication in and of itself when used appropriately, but let's be clear that the cause is something deeper and to help the person get the skills to deal with that loss is where it's at. And when family members pass away, it, it challenges the whole family system. It does. Um, We've had my mother-in-law pass away, and so there is a loss. And uh, we just feel like going to where she would have been like, and it's like, oh, she's not there. And so it's like, where do we go now? And I know when my father passed away, I realized I was the oldest male Bolin in that clan. And just a strange dynamic. Um, and we have now a new granddaughter which is changing the family system of my um, daughter and son-in-law. Yeah, that their, their life as a twosome is not going to be that way anymore. And there is a healthy loss there where it was just the two of us and now it's the three of us. It's a good thing, but it's an adjustment. Um, they say it's a good idea for couples to work on their marital relationship after that baby turns about one. There's some truth to that, I think, just to deal with the adjustments because you can lose connection when now we're so focused on the baby. Um, I think a lot of men could feel jealous. Of, I'm not saying this about them, but I think you can feel a little bit lost. Like now I feel like I go to work and it's mom and the kids, you know, and the kids run the mom. <laughs> they run the dad too, um, but not for the same needs as they run the mom. I worked with an individual who was sad. When they got hurt, they ran to the neighbors. Their family system was so broken that they felt more comfort from the neighbor mother to go run and get bandages there. Something else about family systems is they're passed on. So it's not really just about our parents or us, it's about our grandparents. When I see, and I won't get into my personal family system, not so much because of me, but I wanna honor other family members, but um, it helped me to understand where my grandparents came from and what they had to deal with to understand my parents better. I, it was just so much easier to have understanding there when you saw what they went through and it trickled down dynamics um, to, to, I think, yeah. Uh, we'll talk in generality. Say like in the family, someone passes away tragically and mom and dad are so scared to have another child, but then they have another child. Are they gonna be clingy? 
Well, they could be clingy or they could be not clingy enough. Uh, there's a classic movie called The Yearling. It's one of the most good movies I like, but it's sad. It's, it's, I've, I'll, I'll put it in the description, the writer of this classic novel called The Yearling. But it's a story that takes place a long time ago in the Everglades in Florida, where a young um, son lives with his parents. And I want to say it's Gregory Peck and Grace Kelly. I hope it's Gregory Peck. I think it is. It's probably one of the most touching scenes of a father's son, really. It's a father's son movie. And Grace Kelly does such a good job of, of acting. But um, you go out and you go, why is the mother kind of distant and cool and cold? cold, cooler. And then you see um, a, um, a scene where she's out in, in a kind of a swamp area. I mean, you realize they did a good job with the film, just out living where there's a not much there. And you see all these little grave markers. Kind of breaks your heart. You realize she had been through so many losses with so many children. It's just hard for her to really cling to Jody. It's this um, little boy. The boy bonds with a fawn. They find um, a, this won't spoil it for you, but they have found this fawn, this little, year, this little um, deer. And the boy always really wanted a dog while he bonds with this that deer. And I'll let you get into the story. It, it's it's so worth watching um, because it really um, teaches you about family dynamics, about bonding, uh, and how hard life was back then. Um, things that are interfering with family systems. Okay, um, let's talk about that. I think technology is affecting family systems. And it's gonna look like I'm going on an anti-technology thing, but let's just consider these dynamics. Before technology, let's go back, well, to the yearling, let's go back to the, you know, those country days, Wild West and all that. They did not have the same dynamics. I mean, they had similar dynamics, for instance, you would see people leave their family to go out west. And you would see a tearful scene of grown up daughter going off with her husband, maybe with their children and the grandparents just crying, but being tough, realizing they had to move, they had to be out on their own. So they went and they may never see him again or they knew that they may see them again when they had enough money or they made it. Um, it would be letter writing, which would take months to get. There were no telephones, okay? Um, they would read the letters over and over for entertainment. Yeah, so that's a different <laughs> dynamic than we have with texting today, with email today with um, uh, teleconferencing or Zoom or FaceTime with videos. So all those things are pretty cool to be able to communicate that way and to communicate in real time and to be able to talk with loved ones across the U.S. Uh, so there are some positives there, but it changes the dynamics. Like kids might not miss their grandparents as much because they see them more often through the internet. My daughter went to Ireland for 10 months. It was a strange experience. Um, I was really kind of challenged because she's going away. She's going out by herself. I won't be able to help her. Now talk about a leap of faith just letting go, bye-bye. And there she was in the airport. 
And I want to be sensitive to her story, but I think I can show the dynamics. You can only imagine what it's like to separate like that, even though it's such a good thing. And she was taking care of two children um, in Ireland. It was a great experience for her. Um, there was a sense it was easier to let go when there's nothing you can do versus if they were down the street. Um, I wanted to give advice on things. I decided it was best if I just did a little personal blog that she could tap into. Here's what you might do financially. This is what you might do this. And I made a little homesick remedy thing. If she got homesick, she'd hear about what we were doing and she could tap into that. Um, but when we went to visit her, we had kept in contact enough through maybe once every two weeks or longer. It felt like I could have connected more, but through um, Skype it was. And it was so interesting. It's like, well, hi. And I gave her a big hug. I thought it was going to be this dramatic thing, but it wasn't because I had just seen her on Skype. It's kind of weird, um, those dynamics. But here are the challenges is that I do think maybe aren't, people aren't sitting down to dinner together. That texting is actually getting in the way of the communication. And you've heard me probably talk about the dynamics of that, that we're really not using face-to-face -face communication. We're not really um, taking the time to think things out, what we want to say as if we were writing a letter or email, but it can become impulsive. And it may not even be a conversation in one setting. It could be spaced out throughout the day. So I work with families where they say they're fighting and arguing. And I first ask, well, is this texting or whether this is a talk to talk face to face? This is weird. I'd say 95% of the time they go, well, it's texting. I said, yeah, just try not to text here. Just not helpful. I have a little lecture I do, but the quick story on the lecture is, Texting says, I don't want to have a face-to-face -face conversation. I don't want to talk to you on the phone. I don't want to hear the voice inflection or tone or that nonverbal that could really give me more. I just want words, which is 8%. And I really don't even want to have the conversation typed out like in an email. I want it on a small device where there is chances for autocorrect to interfere with our communication, for me to impulsively push send. And I really want to do it in such a way where the conversation could be spaced out over five hours. And when you're actually watching it or, or reading it, you could be watching TV or you could be cooking dinner or anywhere else. Or you could be having a fight with someone else and then you text me. So it's interjecting. Like, if there was a worst way to communicate something important, this would be it. I say all that to say that on a positive side, maybe telling someone you love them or you give them safe travels or you um, love the time you spent or show a picture or hearts and emojis could be a very good, easy, simple way to communicate. And it's really not a bad thing. I think that after you spent like the afternoon with someone, and if you call them and say, hey, I'm home now, <laughs> I'm safe, I love it. It would feel like too much where a nice text is really quite nice that way. Um, so it's not all bad. I think we just have to think this through and ask yourself, how are the dynamics there? If say like one mother or father is big on texting and the other one isn't, who's going to be closer? Let's see. Or do we text both people if we really want to communicate to both? That could be valuable to have both people. And so you see the systemic, like you may text two people, but one is more likely to respond. That's a system. And pretty soon the system begins to run us. So systems theory is about adjust the system and people get better. Open systems are open to new friends and people coming to the house. Closed systems are kind of rigid. People can't come to the house. 
So I grew up with a closed system. We did, I didn't have people over to the house. It would be a big deal. Um, and there's positive advantage to each. A closed system, you feel like it's your house and you have privacy. And when you had company, you really knew it. Um, open systems, there's people there every day. You could have people having lunch every day. And, and I, I think that I, I kind of thought that would be fun to have that. To have that drop by kids come over and um, open systems allow for new family members to join like marriage. Um, it's not this blood is thicker than water. For closed systems, it's hard to get in the door. Um, there's controlling family systems where the, the MO is really kind of control each other and talk for each other and have poor boundary systems where you're really, you can't really do what you want to do and you're really confused as to what you want to do because is this the family unimine <laughs> making you do something? And where addiction comes in is a lot of times people are propelled out to do addiction because it feels like a breath of fresh air or like an affair. It's like fresh air because at least I'm choosing it. Is it like jumping off the edge of a cliff? Sure it is, but at least I'm doing it. And it's one thing I know my parents wouldn't approve of. So then we feel compelled to do it. So the more healthy the family system is, you're allowed to um, breathe. So let's let's go into a little handout I have. Share a screen. Uh, this is called controlling families versus healthy families. Um, so these are just some ideas that I kind of have. Controlling families, there's a sense of conditional love. Conditional love is parents, it's more likely to give love as a reward. But then the people don't feel love when you don't achieve. Um, parents can come across as feel like children owe them. And that's pretty dysfunctional. We've seen that. I gave birth to you and so you owe it to me. Or I've done so much for you. Parents, children have to earn parental love. We're in healthy families. Um, the nurturing love is there. It's just there. It's a given. It's, it's not conditional. And that's the basis for any achievement. They know their love whether they win or lose, whether they do their homework or they don't, whether they do, you know, they get into problems or not. And, and that makes life much, much better. And, and that's God's love basically for us. Um, children get affection, attention and nurturing touch. They, they're hugged, they get attention, meaning when you're with that person, you feel like they're attending to you. And this is where I think the challenge of technology and buys for attention. Children are told they are wanted and loved. Yeah, and when they say children, like even adult sons and daughters. Controlling families, there's a certain disrespect. Respect, disrespect of boundaries, of feelings, of personal property. Kids are kind of treated a little bit like objects. And sometimes it's so ironic, but the parents demand respect. And I gently but firmly have to say, well, you're not going to get respect until you respect them because you're modeling that. So treat them as people. And not to blame those parents, but they're only doing how they were treated. Parents use the children to satisfy parental needs. This is so subtle, but this is like the parents who grew up with maybe difficult childhoods and so they're counting on their children to help them feel good as parents, or they're more interested in being good parents than they are actually being um, effective or helpful. So let's look at this. When I would talk to the parents about this, it's like, okay, let's turn this into the context of a love relationship because see, we don't really have lots and pressure for me to go be a good husband. I need to be a good husband. I need to be a good husband for my wife. No, 
But parenting, oh sure, there's tons of books, how to be a good parent. Now there's different responsibilities there. But if I was obsessed on being a good husband, it's all about me being a good husband. My wife is gonna go, hey, skip that part. Just have a relationship with me. Let's see. And that's what you wanna have with your children. Just have a good relationship with them. Yes, there's a responsibility of parenting and discipline and stuff like that. But if you just focus on having a good relationship with them, see them as people who, when they're young, they have different needs than when they're older, but it's like a friendship, not that we confuse parenting with friendship, but it can grow into that when your license expires. You know? um, let's go back to our list here. Um, respect, children are seen and valued for who they are. Like get to know your children, get to know your parents. Children's choices are accepted doesn't mean they always get what they wanted, but they're accepted that they do have a choice. Um, dysfunctional or controlling family, there's stifled speech. Communication is hampered by rules, like don't ask that, don't say no, or this unconscious don't talk. Questioning a dissent or discouraged, you'll see that. If you have a differing opinion, the family members just jump, why would you think that? Like, come on. Versus have a conversation, ask questions like in a good way. Like I'm curious what you, so you really believe that about the pandemic or you really think about that, about what you want to do with your schooling. Um, stifled speech and problems are ignored or denied. Like this is probably one of the most powerful common things is they say, well, they won't open up to me. Yeah, my goal as a therapist to help young Tommy or Mary would be to be able to open up with their family members. So they may open up with me first, but my goal is to help them being able to open up with their family members. Again, open communication, expressing honest thought is valued more than saying something a certain way. Questioning a dissenter aloud. Problems are acknowledged and addressed. Emotional intolerance is dysfunctional. Strong emotions are discouraged or blocked. Again, think addiction. Feelings are dangerous territory. And I, I like Mr. Rogers, so think of this. Emotional freedom. It's okay to feel sadness. It's okay to feel fear or anger or joy. Even Christian families, there's this strangely unspoken rule that you know, emotions are to be avoided. And you won't see that in the lives of the saints, nor would you see it in, in Christian literature of the Bible. But we kind of go stoic on this, and, and that can then breed addictions. Um, I think the more you're able to know what you're feeling, the easier it is to be not led by it unconsciously. And feelings are just natural. It's part of our fallen state, but they're natural for us to have them. And they give us information. If I'm feeling sad, it tells me there's something of a loss here. Or I'm feeling angry, there's something that's not right. So when they're blocked or discouraged, um, I'm running on lack of information and I could be at the prey of just having them guide me versus understanding what's going on. And that's why therapy is so simple in many ways. It's helping people explore what's going on and they feel so much better, they say. And now they have insight and they may not know exactly what to do, but a lot of times they do. Um, dysfunctional, controlling family, ridicule. Like in, there are families where they're being mocked, name called, uh, like courtroom dramas, yelling, screaming, criticized. Um, and those are really deadly because it really tells you that you really don't matter. And it's like, what I think is more important than what you think. And as if it's such poor, this sounds judgmental, but it's such poor insight, like me ridiculing or criticizing is gonna change anybody's mind. 
we saw a lot of that in the pandemic. I don't think, maybe a lot of us passed the test, but I'm not sure many of us did. Of how much love are we at the end of this gonna have? So in a healthier family, <clears throat> encouragement, Children's potentials are encouraged. Children are praised when they succeed and given compassion when they fail. It's very simple. Um, and if you grew up in a family where it was pretty healthy, it's easier to do these things. If you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm on the list over here, it's not looking good, um, you can improve. You can improve. You can kind of reparent yourself and not let these dynamics come out in your family relationships. I've made some good choices and good things in parenting, and I've done some things that I regret. Um, it's important to just move on and get healthy. And last but not least, as we're going through here, dogmatic or chaotic parenting, where it's inconsistent Discipline is often harsh and inflexible, so it can be extremely rigid, like the rules are written in cement. And usually there were rules that went a couple of generations back, or it's an antithesis of something. Um, like my mom and dad treated me this way, so now I'm gonna go to this extreme. Parents see their roles as bosses who make their children obey. Parents give children little privacy like no boundaries. And often there's this, my problem, I mean, I, I take my children and make their problems my problems. So I'm gonna fix their homework situation or their relationship problems or fix them. Yeah, it doesn't work. Well, even when they're as young as two years old, their frustration with walking or dealing with things that they didn't get their way is their problem, not the parents. And if the parents feel the energy about that, the kid picks up on it and it doesn't go too well. So, but consistent, or I've heard the term more even parenting, not perfect, but more even. Parents set appropriate and consistent limits. There's a predictability. The rules are really not gonna change. Like simple rules like be respectful. I like be respectful. Um, now, young children need concrete boundaries, like um, don't touch that stove, let's have you over here, you need to stay within the yard. Um, it's important to pick up your toys before we move to the next things. Things that are very concrete, you need to wear clothes. Um, it's important to eat some food here before you have a treat. Um, but being respectful is a great rule, it's simple. It'd be respectful of people's feelings, difference in age, elders, that older people are taking care of you and earning money and providing a house, respectful of people's property, respectful of people's um, need for space, um, different property like that's not your toy, that's their toy, you need to ask. So yeah, it, it goes on and on. And, and, and then you as a parent educate the be respectful means this here and means there. So when they're older, yeah, swearing at people or um, taking car without permission or not telling you when you're coming back. It's not for control. It's just being respectful to, to know that other people um, care about you and want to make sure you're safe and want to know where you are. Yeah. And when you do this consistently, your kids, even though they may balk at some of this, will understand this is how mom and dad have always been. Um, we're not perfect, but most of us are reasonable. And so having reasonable rules. Parents see their roles as guides and leaders who will follow through with rewards and consequences for behaviors. This is work. And if you're too busy um, this is going to be a challenging statement, but if you're too busy to learn how to parent your children effectively and you're going to do this as a convenience, it usually, I'll say it really roughly, it'll come to bite you in the butt because your kids will have problems 
and then you'll be scrambling to a therapy office. And often it's because you didn't set really good limits and, and rules and spend the time and invest in them. And so now they have these problems with all kinds of things, um, trying to have limits set in their life. Yeah, it comes back to haunt people. And I only say that as an encouragement to, to work on it as soon as you can. And if you're already there uh, with teenagers or young adults that it's like a mess, don't lose heart. Um, you may not be able to parent anymore, but you can respond as a loving father and husband and make changes now. There's no point in putting therapists, putting down people there, but no, we work where we are. Um, but my challenge is to help you to, to work on it there because it doesn't really just get better without um, work. Parents allow children some reasonable control over their own bodies and activities. Really important you know, that they get to choose. Um, sometimes you get this thing of, hey, my son, my daughter's telling me no or telling me this and that. Well, they got to have some choice. You want them to be able to say no to other people. So, well, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Hopefully you can take the principles that have been useful and leave the rest. Um, but I wish you well in your recovery journey. And if you like what we have, go ahead and like it. If you want to leave comments, certainly, and we can do um, future um, podcasts on this as well. You take care and have a great evening.